All right, so let me share my screen. Oh, I think you're gonna have to give me permission to share. Right there, thank you. All right, hopefully you guys can see that. All right, so hey everyone, uh, I hope everyone has had a good week so far and I'm hoping that the topic today will be like a good way to finish finish the week. So um, I'm gonna be taking a departure from the usual applications that we've been seeing for quantum computing and you know, even departing from the domains that we spoke on in our first reading group meeting. Uh, I thought it would be interesting to talk about some of the creative applications of quantum computing uh, in the midst of all the industry hype that's ongoing. Um, so, you know, given the versatility of computing in general, uh, shedding light on all aspects of this versatility is, I think, very important. Um, so I'm not going to waste any more time and just get right into it. So, oh shoot. Okay. so the University of Plymouth's Interdisciplinary Center for Computer Music Research is championing a new field of research that is now becoming more well known under the name of, oh yeah, I didn't even intro what I'm talking about, my bad. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about, um, uh, it's basically like a, a music composer of sorts and it utilizes an inverse fast Fourier transform sound synthesis and uh, adaptive sequencing, um, sequencing methods. And the original paper is by Eduardo R. Miranda. I've linked a paper and a uh, article that were both written by him on Slack. So if you guys wanna check that out later, you, uh, you guys are welcome to. All right, so as I was saying before, the University of Plymouth has uh, this interdisciplinary center for computer music research and they're championing a new field of research that is now becoming more well known under the name of quantum computer music. Uh, like personally, I've always been interested in seeing like these strange um, uh, intersections between seemingly unrelated fields. Uh, so this paper definitely caught my eye when I was scrolling through Google Scholar. Um, so the research group has produced a musical composition which they have done with the name Zeno. Uh, this is their first practical application of their research. Uh, this composition was specifically designed for clarinets and other electronic sounds. Uh, I'm guessing like synthesizers and things of that nature. Uh, so basically the aim is for a musician to be playing live alongside the quantum computer and then um, uh, it would, the, the computer would listen to it and then output a melody of its own basically. So I'll start by talking about uh, a little bit, you know, what, what constitutes this niche field of quantum computer music and discuss some related work. And then I'll transition into talking about algorithmic music systems focusing on the systems developed by the research group, which they call uh, QSYN, which I guess is like a quantum synthesizer and QSEC, which is an adaptive melody generator. And then finally, I'll discuss how these music systems were employed in the development of uh, their music composers, Dino. So that's the general order of topics. So let me just give you guys like a sort of overall, uh, uh, like a, a bird's eye view of the field so far. So saying that music with a computer is a recent development would definitely be far from the truth. In fact, the development of music via a computer has been in the works right alongside the development of computer science with musicians getting their hands uh, into computing before it, it even became a hallmark of our industries today. So for example, um, to track uh, the progress of a running program by playing back a sound. So like as the program ran, they could see how much of the program had uh, run by playing back a sound. Um, and then 19, in 1951, uh, mathematician Jeffrey Hill, uh, Jeff Hill, uh, programmed the same Mark I computer to play a tune. And then in the late 1950s, there was some groundbreaking work in the field, which was done by uh, the professor of chemistry, Laharen Hiller, and mathematician Leonard Isaacson at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, and they managed to program the ILLIAC computer to compose a string quartet, which they fittingly called the ILLIAC suite. 
So looking at the artists of today, you'd be seriously hard pressed to find an artist who doesn't rely on a computer for their music, maybe for recording, mixing or producing. Uh, so like whoever, most likely whoever your favorite artists are today, they they utilize a computer in some form in the music making process. So given that music is developed right alongside computing, it seems only right that as we march onwards in this uh, direction of quantum computing that music should try its hand at coming along as well. So now I'm going to, uh, so now that we have a sense for how musical composition and music in general has been explored alongside computing, uh, let us explore the notion of algorithmic music and provide some intuition for, you know, what, what do we exactly mean by algorithm, algorithmic music? Because there's definitely a more mathematical side to music as well. It's interesting um, if you look at, uh, um, uh, if you look at, um, uh, the different theories that are uh, that are defined for you know different instruments in music. I think it's pretty interesting to look into that. Um, and then algorithmic music is maybe how to quantize music or uh, in the in the direction of music composition, what sort of techniques you, you know, one would employ. So early approaches to the algorithmic composition of music, which is still used today, generally consists of randomly generated notes based on some kind of algorithm that gener uh, that follows some set of defined rules and conventions. These rules are put in place that somehow constrain the randomization of the notes to sound more like something a human may have composed. Um, so as you see here, uh, if you have some uh, ordering of notes uh, this, uh, on, on this octave, then we can define some set of rules that may show up in music that people are used to listening to. and you know, you could just uh, do some transitions randomly and that could define some sort of melody that, that sounds like something you might hear, even though it's uh, computer or like algorithmically generated rather than uh, using a human. So uh, the, the most natural way, uh, oh wait, so another approach that utilizes a probability distribution over a certain scale of notes to bias the system to select certain notes over others uh, I had actually worked on a project of a similar nature where as input, I had text files for different melodies. And then um, each of the melodies had like the notes written out in a text format. And then the program would take in all of the input melodies and wait, uh, wait the note transitions uh, based on how often they were occurring in the files. And then based on that, it would, it would output a, I guess a so-called uh, probabilistic melody by choosing the most probable note transitions that occur. Uh, given a current note that it's on. And in theory, it was pretty simple, but I was actually surprised to see the results that came out of it. And I thought, uh, you know, that I guess that's also sort of uh, inspiration for choosing this particular paper. So as you can see here, there's, uh, there's an example of a transition matrix. Um, I just want to make sure everyone can see my slides, right? Okay, yeah. So there's an example of a transition matrix. So um, uh, let's, say, let's say that we were on F. Uh, and we want it to go to C, then there is like a one third chance of that happening. So uh, that that's how that's how it was defined in my project too. So you know, it, given any note, you would just pick which uh, which note transition is most probable, and then eventually, given a certain number of iterations, you would end up with um, uh, some melody. Whether it sounds good or not is you know dependent on how you constrain the system. Okay. All right, so now that we have gained some sort of the history of music and computing as well as a probabilistic method of music composition, uh, let's now start talking about the actual quantum part of this whole deal, uh, beginning with the QSYN, which I think is short for quantum synthesizer. So basically in essence, uh, QSYN is an interactive inverse fast Fourier transform parametrized by a quantum hyperdye. So what that is, it's basically just uh, characterized by a simple quantum circuit, uh, which puts nine qubits into superposition using Hadamard gates. And then you just measure each of the qubits and whatever those measurements are, it sort of acts, it's like a glorified die basically. So that's why the name sounds fancy, but it's not, it's nothing too complicated. So basically how it's, uh, how it's employed is, um, It'll for the system uh, would, uh, in theory, first listen to a tune or melody that's being played in, uh, if, uh, 
if like an actual musician is there alongside a quantum computer, uh, hypothetically, a musician would play some sort of melody, the machine would pick up on it, um, and then it would enumerate the number of notes that were played. It would synthesize as many sounds as there were notes played, and then the timbres of the synthesized sounds are decided by the quantum hyperdrive. So um, uh, one of the goals of the final output of synthesized sound is that it, should, it shouldn't sound anything like the melody that it was based upon, which you know, makes sense. It, it might have, uh, you know, it might hold similar musical form, let's say, but it won't. The goal is not for it to sound exactly the same. So uh, to just provide a little bit more uh, mathematical background, um, we'll take a step back and look at what the Fourier transform and the fast Fourier transforms are in the specific context. Um, you don't want to confuse this with the, their quantum counterparts. This is, uh, since we're working with audio signals here, this is uh, the Fourier transforms in its classical sense. So mathematically speaking, Fourier transforms is, as the name suggests, a transform that takes functions in the time domain to the frequency domain and vice versa. Uh, so this transform is very important in fields such as signal processing, data compression, and complexity theory. And as we all know, this transform has been adapted for quantum computing and is integral in the groundbreaking Shor's factoring algorithm and quantum phase estimation. So here are the, as you can see on the slides, these are the uh, equations describing both the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform. And they're usually known as analysis and synthesis equations. And the reason, uh, so if you're to start with the forward Fourier transform, let's say we're given some sort of arbitrary audio signal, um, then what the forward Fourier transform would do, it's, it's called analysis equation because you can split up that original audio signal into some arbitrary number of sinusoidal, uh, sinusoidal uh, audio signals that if you were to put them together would make the audio signal that you're trying to analyze. And as the name suggests, the inverse does the reverse of that process. So if you were to provide um, uh, the, the sinusoidal uh, audio signals, then it would synthesize them into a single audio signal. Um, so in this particular paper, the inverse fast Fourier transform is what's being implemented. Um, uh, in this case, we utilize this inverse fast Fourier transform, which provides us a way to more efficiently perform discrete Fourier transform, which is just the Fourier transform, but applied to discrete signals rather than continuous ones. Therefore, the equations on the slides would just be replaced by summation symbols as opposed to integrals, but the overall concept is still the same. And I know I give a very quick overview of that. So if you guys want to uh, get a better understanding of it, uh, three blue one brown has a really nice video on the topic and uh, his visuals are always super nice. So you guys should definitely go check that out because I think he did a really good job of breaking down the fundamentals of what it is and explaining it using that. So here we see how the inverse Fourier transform would function as inputs. We have uh, you know, our various audio signals uh, of the notes that are played in the melody. And as an output, we have a synthesized audio signal. If we were to apply the Fourier transform or fast Fourier transform to the output signal, we would retrieve the original audio signals that created it. So that's the general idea there. All right, so with some intuition of the Fourier transform, let us now return to how the quantum synthesizer will actually be implemented. Uh, so let us check out the building blocks of this synthesizer. So. The synthesizer consists of eight oscillators, which each of them produce uh, a, a sinusoidal wave, um, uh, which correspond to notes. Then the oscillator outputs are summed together and they're put through an LFO, which is a low frequency oscillator. Uh, basically, this gives the, uh, the audio signal sort of like a vibrato effect. So if you have heard um, guitarists or violinists or any other uh, uh, musicians who play string instruments, they'll I guess, shake their fingers in a way that creates this uh, sort of oscillating noise. Um, so that's basically what this LFO is trying to mimic. Uh, then we have this ADSR, which stands for attack, decay, sustain, and release. And it's basically an envelope generator. And it's used to just uh, adjust the overall output amplitude of the audio signal. It can, be all, it can also be used to adjust um, other aspects of the audio signal. But in this case, it's being used for this purpose. So let's think back to when I mentioned the quantum hyperdrive, which is nothing but a simple quantum circuit consisting of nine qubits, a Hadamard gate, 
applied to each of the nine qubits to create a superposition state. And then measurements are taken across all qubits. Um, the measurements that we retrieve are used to parametrize our oscillators. So um, the measurements that are taken uh, out of the quantum state give us a set of nine measurements, which we then use to retrieve the parameters of our oscillators. Um, the measurements of the circuit are processed as binary triplets, which correspond to either the frequencies we'd like to retrieve or the amplitudes. And this in, in like in totality, this constitutes the necessary inputs required to configure our oscillators. So if we see here, suppose we have like a list of eight frequencies, F0 through F7, then the triplet 010 would correspond to the decimal number two, the decimal number two, and therefore we'd retrieve the, the second frequency in that in that list. Um, and the hyperdiet is uh, is invoked two times per each sound that we want. And the first time it's to get the frequencies, the second time is to get the amplitude, and that way each of our oscillators has like a well-defined uh, sinusoidal wave that that it's that is used. Um, and these are what the synthesizer and the hyperdiet circuits look like. So we see here um, uh, with our circuit on the right, we just apply a Hadamard on all the uh, uh, on all the qubits, and then we measure them. And then our measurements are used to uh, retrieve the necessary frequency and amplitude values. Um, those are then put into the oscillators, and then the oscillators are uh, uh, they do their thing, and then um, we sum all of those uh, audio signals together, we synthesize them uh, using that inverse fast Fourier transform. And then we use the LFO and the ADSR to, uh, I guess, make the, make the audio signal that comes out sound more realistic. And that would be the output. And then this shows um, the, like the binary triplets for uh, retrieving the frequencies and the amplitude. So as you can see on the first table, this is the binary codes that are related to the retrieved uh, values for the frequency and then you have the amplitudes on the right. All right. Okay, so now that we have an understanding of, uh, you know, how the quantum synthesizer works, we can now move on to the second music system, uh, like the second algorithmic system that's being used here and they call it QSEC. Uh, I think it's short for quantum sequencer and uh, it's basically an adaptive musical sequencer. So basically this system listens to a melody that's played and processes them and spits out a sequence of notes. And that's like a very uh, vague way of saying what it does. So let's get into that. So from the melody that's played, the sequencer extracts three key features, um, which are the pitches, durations, and loudness of the notes in the melody that was played to the system. Uh, based on the transition characteristics of each of these three features, the system then constructs transition matrices. So as we saw before, um, uh, for the for the C through for that one octave C through C, we had a transition matrix that that dictated if we were on a current note, then what's the probability of transitioning to uh, the next note, uh, you know, whatever that note may be. So uh, we use that same concept here um, in our sequencer, uh, and um, yeah, we, we construct transition matrices for all three of these extracted features. Um, and as seen before, these transition matrices are key for producing sequence of notes, which will eventually be our output. So if you continuously apply these transition matrices, you would then get out um, you know, the sequence of notes that you would like. All right, so now we've gotten to the point where you know, all the quantum magic really starts to happen. So let's dive into some of the uh, you know, finer details of this sequencer implementation. Um, so since we're dealing with quantum computers here and the evolution of states is done through unitary matrices, we need to be able to represent our trans transition matrices in a way that a quantum computer can deal with them. Because as they sit, uh, we're not gonna be able to implement them. And although there are nice parallels in the way that you know uh, notes may progress uh, as described by some sort of transition or evolution, um, we can't directly use our transition matrices uh, in the quantum circuit. So we have to be able to adapt them in a way that we retain the necessary information, but uh, they're, they're in the form of a unitary. 
So uh, there was a reference uh, in the paper to a Medium blog written on behalf of Rigetti Computing, um, where James Weaver details an approach that uh, they, they convert the stochastic, uh, the transition matrices into what are called doubly stochastic matrices. Now, these are basically just matrices where if you're to sum each row and each, like if you're to take the sum of the entries of the row, each row and each column, it would sum to one, uh, which makes sense from a probability standpoint. Um, and then you would take those doubly stochastic matrices and turn them into uni stochastic matrices, uh, which are uh, double stochastic matrices whose entries are the square of the absolute values of entries of a unitary matrix. So in essence, what we've done is we've taken our transition matrices, which uh, just have um, uh, like every time you notice some sort of transition in pitch, loudness, or duration, we increment the, the uh, related entry re um, related to that transition. Then we convert the transition matrix into a doubly stochastic matrix. So now all the entries are representative, uh, representative of uh, probabilities of transitions occurring. And then we convert this doubly stochastic matrix into what's called a uni stochastic matrix, which would then be something that a quantum computer could implement. Um, this is this is just a method that was used in a in the paper that was referenced or the article that was referenced in the paper, uh, but the the paper that I'm referring to takes this approach to a slightly different direction, and instead decides to characterize the matrices in terms of a list of angles that are used to rotate qubits based on transition probabilities that are represented by quantum states. So we can see here that um, the transition matrices are converted into a list of angles and they're implemented by um, a rotation uh, Y gate. So uh, it would be uh, the rotate, uh, it basically rotates qubits by an angle theta around the Y axis on the block sphere. So you can see here we have V1 through V18 and keep this in mind because I'll go back to why, why there are exactly 18 uh, rotation angles in, a, in, in the later slides. All right, so this is what the actual sequencer uh, network would look like. So you can see um, each of these uh, uh, rotation matrices are being implemented uh, and then you flip the qubits as well. Um, and then uh, and then you would measure them. So this, this, this whole uh, outline part uh, that's in the dotted lines that represents the whole transition of um, uh, uh, going from one node to the next. So running this circuit once would produce one node. Therefore, uh, if you want to, if you want n nodes, then you would have to arm and then run this circuit n times. All right. So in general, like with our quantum hyperdie. Uh, we're going to reset and run the circuit for the adaptive musical sequencer as many times as the number of notes we'd like to produce, as I said before. Um, uh, the first step, like most other quantum circuits, is to put all of our qubits into superposition by applying a Hadamard on each of them. So as you can see here, uh, basically, um, this this circuit and this, this circuit are the same. They've just compressed this whole, uh, that whole mess into what they call like a transition mega gate essentially um and uh that that that's what's represented here so that big block that you saw before that was in the dotted line is the same as this uh block here okay so uh so yeah we first apply the hadamards to all the qubits and then um, we apply our giant transition uh gate here um and basically, this implements the rotations on our qubits characterized by the transition matrices we first retrieve from our original melody. After measuring our qubits, we have at that point computed a single note. So as I said before, we'd have to run this n times if you want n notes. Um, and as you see here, there's like a sort of feedback loop going on. So every time we measure, we, we uh, input those measurements right back into the transition matrix or the transition gate. Um, and that only makes sense, right? Because uh, based on how the transition matrix was initially defined, if we're at a current note, there's a certain probability of going to the next note. Okay, let's say we go to the next note. Now, now we're seeing, okay, what's the probability of transitioning to the note after that? So that's why every time we measure, our measurement then becomes the new quantum state for when we're about to run the, uh, 
run the circuit again to get our next node. Okay, so now let's descend even further into some of the implementation details to get uh, you know an even better understanding. So uh, I'm gonna use the the example that's given in the paper. So here we have the opening to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and we're going to be utilizing this as the original input to our sequencer. So let's say there's a musician who's playing this on stage. The quantum computer would listen to it, and then it would start its process of um, uh, you know, extracting the features and such like that. So from this opening, our system will extract the metrics I discussed before, the note pitches, duration, and loudness, and represent them as arrays as seen on the slide. So uh, you can see here that given this input melody, we would get these extracted features for the, um, uh, for the pitch, the duration, and the loudness. Um, and basically the pitch and the loudness are MIDI codes, and the duration is in milliseconds. So that's how uh, the, the, the actual music chart corresponds to these numbers down here where the extracted features are. Um, uh, and then um, one alteration, however, the, you know, there's one alteration that we have to make to our arrays and it's that we have to pick the first four different values in each of the arrays. So you might ask, like, why are we doing that? Uh, and the reason for that is the quantum sequencer circuit can only take four by four unitary matrices by design. So if we go back to how this is set up, right? Um, uh, we're, we're dealing with two qubits at a time. Like if we look across, there's nothing that's uh, connecting more than uh, two qubits at a time. So our unitaries would then have to be uh, four by four. So like we have this uh, control, we have these controlled rotations here. So those would have to be four by four. So, uh, you know, we could potentially increase circuit depth in order to deal with the larger number of notes. However, uh, as we know, that may lead to accelerated decoherence of our system. So, you know, if we wanted more notes, uh, then we could do that. But, you know, until industry doesn't figure out how to way to uh, make, you know, how to figure out a way to make robust fault tolerant quantum computers, uh, we won't be able to extend circuit depths in general, uh, let alone this one. So having established usable values for our pitch, loudness, and duration, which are in the top right. Sorry, that got cut off a bit, um, but uh, you get the idea. Basically, we're picking the first four different numbers, and that's how we're defining our new uh, arrays of uh, pitch, uh, duration, and loudness. Then based on that, we, con we now construct our uh, transition matrices, or uh, more specifically, our doubly stochastic matrix. Um, and uh, just to, just to be clear, um, uh, since we're not we're not directly using the W stochastic matrix uh, in in the in this paper's implementation, um, the medium blog would then convert this W stochastic matrix into a unitary, which would which could then be uh, implemented directly. This paper decided to extract the angles that I was mentioning before um, uh, as a way of um, uh, as uh, inputs for the rotation gates that are used in the transition gate. Okay, so, and we see here, each of the rows and each of the columns sum to one. So we have our W stochastic matrix. All right, so you guys, uh, you know, may have noticed a couple of slides ago that I listed out the rotation angles and there were exactly 18 angles. So why is that? Uh, recall that we were primarily concerned with extracting three main features from the listen melody. As I've said before, that we have the note pitches, the duration and the loudness. And then using these three metrics, we defined our transition matrices accordingly, as we saw in the last slide. So then how do we get our three transition matrices to be represented by these rotation angles? So we first start with three identity matrices that have six degrees of freedom each. That means they can, uh, we, we can uh, uh, impose some sort of rotation on each of these six degrees of freedom. Uh, so we start out with these identity matrices and the, the goal is that we rotate these identity matrices until they're as close as possible to the transition matrices we had defined for our three metrics. And basically what that's doing now is that now based on how much we've rotated those identity matrices, we have rotations that correspond to our transition matrices. Um, and then those rotations can then be implemented in our quantum circuit. Uh, uh, and basically, as I said before, the rotation gates are on the y-axis of the block sphere. 
So based on our doubly stochastic matrix, you can see on the slides, um, yeah, just, so just to reiterate, we have the three metrics times the six degrees of freedom, and that gives our total 18 rotation angles, which corresponds with what I was saying before. So based on our doubly stochastic matrix, you can see on the slides the deduced rotations for each of the three metrics. Um, each of these rotation arrays have rotations defined on uh, each of its six degrees of freedom. Uh, if we take the union of these three, so we have the um, we have the rotations for the pitch, the duration, and the loudness. And in this example, it's in degrees as opposed to radians. Um, and if we take the union of all of these, then we get our uh, we get our eighteen uh, our list of eighteen angles that we would then uh, you know our eighteen element rotation array, which we then implement in our quantum circuits. All right, so if we were to simulate this entire process, this is sort of what it would look like. So let's say, uh, you know, as I said before, uh, in round one, our first step is to, our first step is to uh, apply a Hadamard to each of the uh, qubits. And we're, we're starting in the computational basis. So we have our six qubits. Um, we have these pairs where each pair uh, we're, we're applying the transition matrices to each of these pairs of qubits. So, uh, for example, we'd, we might apply the, the, the transition matrices related to the pitch to the first pair, the transition matrices related to the duration of the second pair, and so on. So let's just say that uh, our measurement results for the first round that we ran our quantum circuit, we got 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0. So um, if we were to go back to this, we see that whatever our outputs are for the, uh, you know, whatever, whatever our measurement outputs are, that becomes our input state for the next time that we want to run the circuit because that's how the transition is defined. So we have, uh, then, then we define our quantum state for the next round as such, and then we keep going. Um, and yeah, you, you would keep going. Each of these rounds represents uh, producing a new node, basically. All right, so how do we actually generate a note along with its characteristics now? So each measurement defines a set of three binary codes where each code has two binary digits. The first pair defines which pitch set to retrieve the note from. Uh, in this paper, uh, they define four pitch sets with four pitches in each set for a total of 16 pitches. So uh, we, uh, the, first, the first pair, if we have our measurement, which is M0 through M5, the first binary code uh, would be M0 and M1. Um, and that would establish which pitch set, uh, pitch set uh, the note would be retrieved from. So we have four such pitch sets. Uh, so 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So one of those would give us our pitch set. Then M2 and M3 define the established note durations. So in this particular paper, they have four possible durations. We have the eighth note, quarter note, half note, and dotted half note. Um, and then M4 and M5 would then, after we've chosen our pitch set, we would choose one of the four pitches from that pitch set. And then that would establish our final pitch for that note. Um, and as you can see, all these par parameters could be adjusted for a specific use case. Uh, and also the number of pitches and durations and such have been kept relatively low to account for the added complexity that more number of pitches would bring. For example, you know, if we would have uh, you know, we would have required nine qubits if we want, had, you know, if we had wanted to have binary codes of length three as opposed to length two. And you know what that would do is like, okay, if we had um, binary codes of length three, uh, then we could have eight pitch sets with, uh, you know, maybe eight pitches in each of those sets. And now you've you've exponentially increased the number of uh, pitches to choose from, uh, but at the same time, you've also increased the complexity of the quantum circuit. In this paper. Uh, for complexity reasons and practicality reasons, they've kept these numbers relatively low. So uh, this gives you, this sort of gives you an overview of how this sequencer architecture would scale if, you know, if, if you wanted greater functionality. All right, so that was probably a bunch of information all at once. Um, uh, so this is sort of how in effect they, they implemented their Xeno composer and how they put everything together. So you have their clarinets playing and the clarinet, let's say uh, there's some uh, 
uh, data preparation that's done and that's sent over to the quantum computer. The quantum computer then processes these notes using the quantum hyperdyne, and the quantum sequencer. You play the notes, you synthesize them, and then you send them back. Um, it's played here and then it's played through some sort of speaker. And uh, yeah, that's how this whole thing would work. Um, so yeah, that's all I have for you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed. Thanks. So, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. So, so there are three metrics and six degree of freedom. So, what are the yeah. six degree of freedom for? Like, you know, the paper wasn't super specific about that because, like, uh, that that was like the main point that I was kind of stuck on too. Is like, well, why six degrees of freedom? Yeah. Um, so, uh, like, I don't know if this is correct, but based on just from reading the paper, it seems like it was kind of arbitrary, and that's how they defined. Um, Okay. Uh, define the rotations. So uh, let me show my screen. Again. Sorry. So if we go back to the circuit, um, this, is, this is kind of the layout of the circuit. So you have like uh, you would you would first do like some sort of phase uh, or bit flip, and then uh, interspersed you have these uh, rotation gates mm -hmm. corresponding like v1, v2, v3, v4, v5, v6. So you can see that for uh, we're, we're using six of them for each pair of qubits. Uh, as you saw that we, we got um, six, uh, for, we had the six degrees of freedom for each of the three metrics. So let's say that the top two qubits are, are, are um, related to the evolution of our pitch uh, over time. So then we would employ the, the, um, uh, these these rotations that we got from our transition matrices and mm -hmm. use them in the um, in the circuit. I see. And could you uh, could you go back to the slide where he was uh, approximating the uh, transition matrix using uh, these different uh, rotation matrices? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I said that explicitly in the slides. Let me see. Is it, is this a slide? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So how, how could, could you repeat, how did he get these like specific numbers for the rotation angles? Yeah. So since, uh, so I could start at the, so we get our transition matrices, right? We have these doubly stochastic matrices that have the probability transition or probability of certain no transitions. Uh, but the issue is, is that we don't have, uh, you know, the other method suggested just turning those transition matrices into unitaries, and mm -hmm. that would be one way of directly implementing it. Yeah. But in the way they're suggesting, they want to use these rotation gates, right? But given the transition matrix that we have with us, we have no notion of what sort of rotations are being, uh, um, uh, you know, are on those six degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. So we start off with three identity matrices, and we uh, do rotations on those six degrees of freedom on identity matrices um, uh, in, a, in a way such that we minimize the differences in the entries between the, uh, the altered identity matrix and our transition matrices. So then through that process, we get our set of rotations. I see. Hmm. And did the paper like ever ever say like which method would be better like in terms of uh the final difference between the uh approximated matrix and the transition matrix you know i guess if we're just going based on that i feel like like when i was reading it too i felt like it would be easier to just implement the matrix directly like you have mm -hmm. it turn it into a unitary and just use it like that because yeah but i guess there is some i guess approximation that needs to be done because the the uni stochastic matrix is the square of the absolute values of entries that would be in a unitary. So mm -hmm. it still works as, as a unitary, but I think there might, there might be some, as there always is some error, but yeah. 
to me that that one struck out as being more uh, more effective but i guess they 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 first referenced that article and then they adapted that so maybe they found some uh, benefit to using this way I don't yeah know. that's pretty interesting uh, why is there rotation along our our direction uh along the y direction oh, uh, on yeah the, yeah y direction oh why uh why is is it why i am not sure actually uh, i think i think that was also arbitrary i don't know if there is a specific reason why it was ry okay um i can look back and try and see if i can get an answer for that though i'm i'm not sure myself okay and also i was wondering how exactly this um the measurement feedback to the transition matrix, do they modify the values? So, um, yeah, so that's that's another thing that I was thinking about, like, as I was saying it, that uh, we would have to be able to, uh, we, we run the circuit once and we get out measurements and theoretically that would be our input for the next time we want to produce a note, right? But the issue is like, how would it, you know, it's based on um, the, uh, whatever the DiVincenzo's criteria, we, we say that, okay, it's easy to define a quantum computer in this sort of, uh, I guess, low energy state, which is all zeros. But I am not really sure how you do it if you have like these ones interspersed. Mm. Um, uh, so like, I think in like the trapped ion thing, they have this, uh, they have like, a, what is that called? Uh, ion pumping or something like that. I forget the terminology, but they, they use that to pump uh like a qubit to the one state so i don't know maybe if that's something they would implement uh, but yeah there doesn't i don't know i don't know if that was the question you were uh, asking but sure that, that makes sense okay do you have like a demo or something for i actually <laughs> wanted to prepare a demo but i didn't have time so oh, okay i think oh, like, that, that's not saying like maybe like a side yeah. project type of thing we could do this i see that's that's like cool. yeah i feel like the whole system if we were to somehow get it to work it would be it would be pretty cool mm -hmm. yeah awesome i really like this uh this one all right cool i'm glad you guys liked it let me uh stop the uh, recording <laughs>